Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose, the executive director at the Long Now Foundation. Um, as many of you know, we have long been working on the renovation of our space at Fort Mason, and uh, we've been calling it the Salon kind of generically, but uh, we finally decided on a name. It is called the Interval, basically the space in between. And we are, uh, the construction is just now finishing up. Uh, the bookshelves are all in, and uh, many of you, I assume, have been seeing some of the book lists we've been publishing uh, for the 3,000 volume Manual for Civilization. Uh, book lists have been coming in from people like Maria Popova, Kevin Kelly, Stuart Brand. Uh, Neil Gaiman just agreed to do a list of books on storytelling, which ought to be fantastic. Um, so those are all coming in, and we'll probably have at least a 1,000 of those volumes on our shelves. We'll also be soon sending out the, the list of the first 1,000 books uh, that we would really love to get used and donated so we don't have to buy them new and cut down more trees. So hopefully some of you have a lot of these books in your collection. Uh, the other little bits of news are that the uh, chalkboard robot, some of you may remember that part of the design. You can see it. Uh, up there, that chalkboard is actually a robot, and it's now being built by Jurg Lenny in uh, Switzerland, who's already built several chalkboard robots. Uh, we found him kind of at the last minute, thought we had invented the idea, but he had. And, uh, and there's still more opportunities to sponsor a bottle or a shelf, um, and it will be filled with the gin or whiskey of your choice before we open. And so please, please do. We're uh, the last about $75,000 worth of fundraising that we need to do, and then we'll actually be able to pay our contractors as they finish up and open our doors. So that will be great. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce our long short for this evening. Many of you know we often do a short film about long-term thinking, and uh, this one I think is particularly apropos for tonight. Uh, basically a 50-year deep space network project that clearly would never have been done with private money. Deep space network is basically required to do the kinds of things that we do in space. Clearly, if you can't talk to your spacecraft and they can't talk to you, there's no point in even sending them out there. The deep space network uh, makes everything that we do possible. Imagine landing night, for example, for Curiosity. Without the Deep Space Network, there'd be no one in there because there'd be nothing to see. They would hear nothing from the spacecraft. No touchdown confirmed, no cheering, no nothing. The Deep Space Network is what helps us figure out where the spacecraft is. We wouldn't even get close to Mars without it. The Deep Space Network comprises of three complexes around the world placed about 120 degrees apart. This ensures us that we are constantly in touch with the spacecraft as the Earth rotates. We're today tracking 33 spacecrafts, not only the U.S. spacecrafts, also the spacecrafts from other countries. And remember, this is not only talking to the spacecraft. We have been able to do radar and radio astronomy, and it was the radar on this antenna that actually was used for even the men landing on the moon. 50 years ago, director of JPL, Dr. Pickering, and NASA established the Deep Space Network to provide communications for all the deep space missions, rather than having each of the missions build their own ground network. We used to use big analog recorders for telemetry signals. We used a two-inch wide tape. In the beginning, the first computers we put in, we had 64,000 words maximum and we had to be able to support every mission, NASA missions, other foreign missions, and digital technology and computers allowed that to happen. If you look at the Cassini mission, we've got a transmitter about an average of 800, 900 million miles away. The transmitter is about the power of your refrigerator light bulb, and that is what is bringing all these incredible images and data back. I think it's a resource to be treasured, but it's a resource that also needs to be nourished. We are looking at missions with higher data rate, more complicated missions with more instruments on the missions. We are looking at optical calm, and with optical calm, one day we should have streaming videos. You can see real time rather than a simulation. Seeing our success in, you know, in almost real time and, uh, and knowing right away and seeing those pictures, all possible because of the DSN. If there was no DSN, there would be no missions. We always remind the missions 
Don't leave the earth without us. Don't leave the earth without me. Uh, good evening, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Uh, Long-term thinking, we encourage it. Um, and that all sounds kind of like, well, that's probably conservative thinking. But actually, long-term thinking can and should be radical, which then gets you into the field of innovation which then gets you into layers and levels of innovation. I'm gesturing toward depth here. And innovations usually recur within a field. So then, who starts the field? Who is thinking so far ahead, so far toward the horizon? Who is dealing with an entity so big and slow and hard to steer that they have to think at horizon level. Uh, that's one of the things we hire government to do. And one of the few people who's really examined how that whole process works is our speaker, Mariana Matsukato. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thanks to you all for coming here. Um, my objective is to convince you in the next 45 minutes, which is how long I'm going to talk, that we absolutely have to change the words, the way we talk about the state, if we want to nurture what everyone today is talking about, which is the need for public-private partnerships. Because I think that while we know and while we talk a lot about the private sector and how important it is to drive innovation, to drive growth, to uh, produce the kind of Silicon Valley type dynamics, we have um, not only underestimated, under talked about the role of the state, but actually the words we use to talk about it, both in economic theory, which I'll talk a little bit about, but also just in common day jargon in the media and also the words that politicians use is extremely problematic and is actually bad not just for the future of innovation, but also for our ability to attack the big challenges today, which are, you know, what kind of growth do we actually want? We are in a moment where we've just experienced probably the worst, or one of the worst, because uh, we sometimes forget about the previous ones, but worst financial crises, where countries all over the world, the US, Europe, Latin America, and Africa, are trying to uh, nurture a post-crisis recovery, and in some cases, especially in the Anglo-Saxon, uh, countries, so the UK and the US, to rebalance away from speculative finance towards the real economy and so, you know, industrial policy is actually back. It's no longer a bad word. Um, but really, you know, policymakers are also saying that we don't just want smart innovation-led growth, which is extremely important, but we also want that growth to be more inclusive, less inequality, um, and more sustainable. Um, so sustainable over time, we cannot keep using resources at the level that we have without thinking about the long-term uh, sustainability of that growth. And the real problem here is that, you know, this actually requires massive, big, creative thinking. And the public sector obviously has a huge role um, in the policies around that space. And we have a massive crisis, I think, today. One of the biggest crises is not just the financial crisis, but the crisis in thinking. Um, and this is really my objective to, you know, nurture, at least here, um, and especially later in the question time, a conversation about how we can actually change the way we talk about the uh, public sectors, the state's role in this massive transformational process that we need. And just some background, uh, how economists talk about this problem, um, and this is important, how, uh, how economists talk about it. Keynes, who you probably know, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was an economist who is known to be probably the most important for actually talking about the role of government. He also had this wonderful quote where he said, you know, practical men and women who think they are completely devoid of any sort of political uh, influence and um, influence of, you know, sort of economic theory are actually the slaves 
of defunct economists. So economic theory is actually out there uh, determining how policymakers and journalists and also just the common man and woman in the street uh, often talk about things without them even knowing what that theory is. And so what I want to talk to you first here on my first slide is that how economists talk about the role of the public sector is very, very limited. It's about fixing different types of problems in the market. Um, the most typical problem is that when you have a public good, um, like basic research, which is very hard to appropriate the returns from that, then you have a market failure, and so the government actually has to intervene and fund that. Um, also, when you have different types of positive and network externalities, when you have, um, Again, I'll use the, the example of basic research. You have very strong positive externalities. In other words, the spillovers are very high. That's one of the reasons why it's also very hard to appropriate the return. So in different areas where you have high spillovers, education, um, defense spending, um, clean air, you have uh, not enough private investment, and so the government has to come in. Okay? Now, there's very little debate about this. Okay, so the reason I speak like, you know, I sound American, but I'm actually Italian, and Stuart did a great job in pronouncing my name, even though when he asked me how should I pronounce it, I said pretend I'm Japanese, because then it sounds, you know, Matsukato, which actually means Christmas tree, apparently, or something like Christmas tree in Japanese. Um, um, the reason I sound American is because when I was five years old, we came to America because my father is a nuclear uh, fusion physicist, and that's an area where it's you know, pretty commonly understood that, of course, that's going to be government-funded because it's, you know, once it's actually going to be discovered, it's going to be extremely hard for any private sector organization to appropriate the profits from it, right? Because it's a big discovery which will be uh, known to all. Now, this is extremely limited view, okay? So market failures, of course, they exist. You know, we now know today that they exist more than ever after this massive types of financial market failures that we just had. But it's, it's, it's interesting that in order to actually tackle those problems, you know, smart innovation-led growth, which is also inclusive, which is also sustainable, if you had government that was just fixing different types of market failures, you can imagine it's going to be quite hard to tackle those challenges. And I have found in my own work, very inspiring, this work by Carl Polanyi, who was a sociologist and sort of historian uh, in between those two fields, who really shed light on you know, what the role of the state has been in the history of capitalism. He actually takes the word the market and really decomposes it. What he says is that local markets, you know, selling kind of fruit and vegetables on the corner of a street, and international markets are actually, you know, really predate capitalism. They've been around for kind of 3,000 years. But the capitalist market, which is usually what we talk about when we use the word market, is very recent. It's only about 250 years old. And it's not natural in any way. It was actually imposed by the state, not just by laws, but different types of funding. And that book itself, I think, is one of the most important books to really debunk, if you want, the way we usually talk about the state versus market. I'm not going to go into that kind of historical perspective. I'm going to be focusing, at least in the first part of my talk, on innovation and what we know the role of the state has been. But um, it's a very important book, which I recommend you read, because it just shows that even when we're just talking about the market in general, we have to understand that it's actually the outcome of different types of organizations. Um, and this, by the way, is very important because today, you know, coming back to this problem of short-term and long-term thinking, we often hear you know, uh, that it's somehow the market which is making particular companies short-termists and thinking too much about their quarterly profits, but actually um, you then look at particular types of uh, sectors, which I'll be mentioning later, and you see massively different ways in which companies in those sectors are reacting to market pressures. And you know, markets are outcomes, outcomes of what, of organizations, what types of organizations, government organizations, business organizations, and household organizations. So again, one of the uh, objectives I have is also to convince you to, to start thinking about that, what kind of business organizations and what kind of government organizations, I won't be talking so much about households, um, do we actually need today to achieve the kind of growth that we want instead of thinking public versus private, business versus state. Um, 
So now what's interesting is that the way, you know, this conversation about government as just fixing these market failures leads to what I said was a very narrow view, which is this view that somehow, yes, of course, government's important, but it's only important in this very restricted domain. You know, this is an example from The Economist, which is saying that government should stick to the basics. And what those basics are, are in fact these kind of public good areas, right? So infrastructure, education, research. Okay, this was a special issue that was thinking about, you know, what's the next big thing after the internet? They were talking about nanotechnology, green technology, and they were very explicit, as The Economist often is in the editorial section. Um, and they said, uh, you know, government, okay, you, you know, of course we need government, you know, also just for private property and, you know, proper legal system, um, but stay in your place, because what's gonna, you know, lead the revolution are the revolutionaries. And who are the revolutionaries? Well, you are sitting in San Francisco very close to all these revolutionary guys. It's the Steve Jobses, Jobses, uh, the Zuckerbergs, um, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Twitters, those kinds of uh, organizations and people that led to them. And while we need government, and we also know that you know, bureaucracy is sort of needed, of course, whoops, that went too quickly, um, what we need government to do is to stay you know, restricted, why? Because what we want is change, we want dynamism, we want the kind of, you know, hunger and foolishness that Jeeves Job, Steve Jobs talked about, but government, you know, is not gonna achieve that, and if it, in fact, gets to be too big, it's gonna, in fact, impede that kind of um, dynamism that we want in order to achieve this smart, innovation-led growth. And so, in fact, policymakers, and I talk to policymakers all the time, I live in Europe, in London, so I talk to mainly European policymakers, but I find that this image is actually pretty international. Uh, this image being that you have business which uh, is sort of in a cage, okay? There's different types of impediments uh, not allowing it to really kind of roar, right? So you have a lion in a cage, and the role of government, besides funding the basics, is also to slowly take away these impediments. And so different types of taxes, Right? Tax incentives, reduction of tax, but also tinkering with whether it's R&D tax um, or other types of tax incentives, but especially taking away all this you know, red tape, this bureaucracy, this regulation. Okay? This view of business as a roaring lion in a cage and government important for creating the conditions for that lion to rage, roar, and create that innovation knowledge economy, and also government to take away these impediments is extremely strong. In fact, um, um, if you look at lots of the post-crisis uh, policies that are trying to uh, foster this kind of innovation, at least in the UK, for example, I count as something like 14 new types of tax incentives, right? So that's about taking away the impediments and the assumption that then this line's gonna come out. Now, what's very interesting about this quote, which is, again, Keynes's quote, John Maynard Keynes, who's one of the most important economists who actually thought about the role of government in the economy, right or wrong, is not the point, but he's probably the biggest thinker about why government is actually required to intervene in the capitalist economy. He actually got a bit stuck. You know, this is a, a, a wonderful letter. Uh, it was actually a private letter, uh, no longer, as you're all looking at it, um, that he wrote to Roosevelt in 1938, where, and I'm not going to read the whole quote, but he's kind of saying, hmm, uh, well, I use this word animal spirits, right? So the word animal spirits came from his analysis of why you actually need a government to intervene. He said, if you look at GDP, which is how we calculate growth, you have consumption expenditure, private business investment, government expenditure, net exports, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. I, private business investment, is the one he focused on a lot. He said it's too pro-cyclical, and it's also always very volatile. Okay? In fact, if you're ever interested in, in looking at this data, just get an Excel sheet. Um, hopefully you know how to use it, unlike uh, Reinert and Rogoff, who we know uh, had problems with it, but no comment. Um, <laughs> that, was, that wasn't very nice. Um, um, and you actually plot investment. You can get this data from um, the Government um, Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, website. And you, and you just plot it over time, it really is like that. Whereas consumption expenditure, which is one of the biggest components of GDP, is actually quite stable. Okay, it's more or less a monotonic function of disposable income. And what he said is that the reason 
you know, well, first of all, that the fact that this I is so volatile is the reason you need G to come in, government expenditure, to stabilize aggregate demand. But what was interesting was the word he used to describe I, right? He said, it's driven by animal spirits. Okay, so that's why it's so volatile. So you can't just tinker with tax and interest rates and get it to increase, because what animal spirits is, or are, is the um, gut instinct about where the future technological and market opportunities are. Okay? And he said, because that's quite uncertain, and really uncertain, it's not just risky, it's uncertain, so completely unpredictable, it's very hard to manage that eye just with tinkering with tax and interest. That's why government has to stand ready to inject demand in you know, times of recessions especially. And in this letter, he's kind of like thinking to himself, because this has not been taken up by any of the big Keynesian economists, you know, people like Stiglitz and, and Krugman who write in uh, the media today, I don't think have thought enough about this question here, which is, oh dear, what if it's not wolves, tigers, and lions in that cage? But what if it's like a gerbil <laughs> or a pussycat? You know, that's going to be very different in terms of policymakers. Uh, now, I'm kind of embellishing what probably was going on his, in his head, because this was also obviously a very specific time in which he's writing. But let me just say what I I'm thinking. You know, what, if it is a domesticated animal, and not a lion and wolf and tiger, mm, the role of policy is no longer just to take away the impediments and let this lion roar. It's actually to get that pussycat to grow into a lion, to actually get the courage up, to want to invest, okay? And today, by the way, where we have record level hoarding rates, right? There, there, there's no lack of money. There's just a complete lack of courage to be investing. In the US, the, the hoarding rate of the private sector today is close to $2 trillion. In the US, it, sorry, in Europe, it's um, close to $1 trillion. Um, but this isn't just since the crisis. You, you, we, we have lots of hoarding going on, lack of want to invest. This is a huge problem for policymakers, how to unlock it. And if you're just thinking that you have to take away the impediments, it's going to be much harder if in that cage you have, again, a gerbil. Now, Warren Buffett, who is an extremely smart man, we know because also he's made all sorts of money using the smarts, even though I, I think of, often for others it's been just being at the right place at the right time, that this guy has consistently made lots of money from some of his knowledge. I think this is a, an extremely important quote, which actually supports what Keynes is trying to say, which is that, you know, investment is not about just taking, you know, making it easier. He says, you know, when... Um, capital gains rates were quite high. And I'm going to come back to that rate, by the way. So remember the year he actually put up there, 1976, capital gains in the U.S. was close to 40%. And in 1981, it was already 50% less than that. And since then, has been coming down. I'll come back to this point later. But he says, people invest to make money in potential taxes, so costs of that investment, have never scared them off. So you invest when you have those gut instincts about where these future opportunities are. Okay, um, this is a radical point, and this comes back to the whole animal spirit. So then the question really is, you know, what then drives those new opportunities, those technological and market opportunities, which are so important for driving business investment, which is a very important part of GDP. And where is the revolutionary, coming back to that economist quote, um, if you want spirit of those investments? Is it true that government is just completely inertial, bureaucratic, and only needed to create the conditions for this revolutionary private sector to do their thing? Um, and I think it's very illustrative to then think about you know, particular types of technologies, not just going from an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 5, but you know, revolutionary general purpose technologies which have affected how all sectors work. Okay, that's what a general purpose technology means. A, 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 a new technology which really radically increases, for example, productivity in sectors beyond the particular area where it emerged. And what's absolutely fascinating about all these examples, nanotech, the internet, biotech, and I'll give you some data later on the emerging green, if you want space internationally, is that what government did, and I'll focus mainly on the US in, in these examples, but increasingly it's outside of the US, 
did so much more than just fix the public good problem, okay? So this is the innovation chain from basic research to product commercialization. And the orange uh, names there are public sector organizations in the US, state organizations, um, which played an absolutely pivotal role, a revolutionary role, and a mission-oriented role. This is a very important point. So many of the investments that led to those general purpose technologies were not fixing market failures. They were actually creating big missions. Government was thinking big. It was thinking in a revolutionary, pretty radical way from putting a man on the moon, which actually required 17 different sectors to interact, um, to thinking of the internet before the internet existed, thinking of nanotech, the word nanotechnology itself came out of scientists who were working within the National Science Foundation. That story is very well um, uh, described in a particular book. Um, and um, what's also interesting here is that the, the early stage funds for many of the companies were provided by the public sector. So let me just move on to that particular graph. Yeah. So you know, when you think of early stage seed finance, it's extremely risky in the in the early stage. That's why it's called early stage seed finance. And what's striking is that it was often government funding, in particular through this small business innovation research program, but also the SBIC, STTR, all public funds, which have been even more important than private venture capital. So Apple, Compaq, Intel all got early stage funding, not only from the public sector, but some public funds were absolutely critical. In the case of Compaq and Intel, it was SBIR. In the case of Apple, it was 500K, which at the time was a lot, provided by an SBIC grant. Let me just back up here. I'm terrible with slides. I go back and forth. Um, but you know, again, coming back to this word revolutionary, which that Economist article used, you know, what makes an iPhone a revolutionary phone? It's obviously what you can do with that phone. And this is a particular graph out of my book where I show that every single technology which makes you do cool things, whether it's you know, uh, searching the web through the internet, GPS, knowing where you are, touchscreen display, being able to use that phone in a very easy way, even um, the new Siri voice-activated system, which on my phone never seems to work, um, but you know, apparently it's a revolutionary technology. Um, it was all government-funded. All of it. These are the particular state agencies, which, you know, it's really important that when I use the word state, I'm not talking about big brother, you know, even a ministry. I'm talking about a decentralized network of different agencies, which are absolutely fundamental to, um, to uh, the outcome of these technologies. And so, of course, someone like Steve Jobs was absolutely essential, and there's not enough people like him uh, with a sense of design, of simplicity, of putting those existing technologies together in a very cool way. That's an extremely important role, absolutely fundamental. We know a lot about that. There's that great biography, but not one page of that biography actually mentions the public funding which, which went into this revolutionary new phone. Um, now, often when I talk about this in Europe, they get scared. They're like, oh my gosh, she's talking about the military-industrial complex, and no, we don't like that, right? And the point is, well, no. You know, uh, that ended up becoming a model, the DARPA-type model that actually funded the internet. We see that type of organization, that type of funding role actually across different departments today, whether it's health or energy. This is the funding which is absolutely astounding, I think, in terms of the numbers that goes into, so it's public funding through the National Institutes of Health, which nurture a particular area, which is basically life sciences, biotech, and pharma, 32 billion a year was spent in 2012. Okay, so if we're very worried about our debt to GDP, well, of course, this does increase debt. But if this kind of funding is also fostering growth, right, which is the, de the denominator of debt to GDP, this is what's actually needed also to reduce debt to GDP. The problem in, in, in a country like Italy, which is where I'm from, is not that they were spending too much. In fact, if you look at the deficit level in Italy before the crisis, it was actually quite small. Uh, it was about 3 to 4 percent, less than Germany's. Um, the problem in Italy is that for 20 years, they have not been spending on these kind of areas like R&D and human capital formation, which means that you know, the GDP growth has been almost nil for 14 year, or 15 years. Um, and so even with a moderate deficit, 
the debt to GDP if the denominator is, is growing at zero and the, and the numerator is growing even just at three to four percent, that ratio by definition can almost go to infinity. Um, now, what's interesting also about this NIH funding, again, coming back to the word revolutionary, is that different studies, including a great book by Marsha Angels called The Truth Behind the Drug Companies, shows that that funding has been absolutely essential, not just to you know, general research, but actually to the development of particular drugs, in other words, the revolutionary new molecular entities with priority rating, instead of just Me Too drugs, slight variations of existing drugs. Um, so it's been fundamental to fostering change, dynamism, revolutionary uh, innovations within this particular sector. Um, now, I, call, uh, I called my book The Entrepreneurial State because entrepreneurship is not just about setting up a company. It is, in fact, doing what I've been talking about, which is the ability and willingness to engage with real risk and uncertainty. And so if you think of any sector in terms of the technology and market risk, um, the point is that it's that upper right-hand quadrant which is often completely starved of private finance. And I'll show you later a figure with, in the green economy where the upper right-hand quadrant is in fact being funded almost exclusively today by the public sector. Think of it as in, in terms of you know, capital intensity on the vertical axis, technological and market risk on the, on, on the horizontal, the upper right-hand uh, quadrant is where we don't see business today entering in the green space. Um, now, you know, one of the, the issues that the economist there was thinking about was, you know, well, what will be the next big general purpose technology? What's going to be the next big change? If we think of Silicon Valley, close to this place where we're talking today, some of the big changes are in fact, you know, uh, being engineered today by companies like Tesla Motors. Tesla Motors received a 500 million guaranteed loan from the Obama administration. Um, it's the same amount that uh, Solyndra received. We all know about Solyndra. <laughs> we don't know uh, much, well, many people don't know that Tesla also received the exact same amount of money. When I say innovation is uncertain, I mean it's really uncertain. For every internet, you have 10 Concords. Uh, and Concord is actually a bad example for a failure, because if you actually look at all the spillovers that happened from that uh, publicly funded experiment, it was actually quite successful. But the plane itself, was not a success, and it's often used as an example of government failing, you know, trying to get too involved, picking winners. And, you know, what I've shown you up until now is, you know, Apple was picked, Compaq was picked, Intel was picked, the Internet was picked, GPS was picked. It's not about whether government should be picking, but how it does it, and how it also, I'll argue later, is able to uh, reap in some reward when it actually succeeds in order precisely to fund the losses. Um, so again, looking at green, which many of us are hoping is really going to be the next big thing, um, it's very interesting to ask, you know, who's funding what in that green? And so, yes, that's the upper right-hand quadrant is completely being starved today, uh, for example, private venture capital. Um, and what's interesting is that it's not a lack of money. In fact, the whole sort of finance debate is interesting because we often think there's sort of a lack of money. And I just mentioned before, in the private sector, there's plenty of money. It's just not being spent. Um, we also have plenty of venture capital. It's just not, you know, choosing particular areas today. Oops. Um, it's not actually engaging in some of the more uh, difficult areas. Why is this? Because the venture capital model itself is based on the exit, okay? You want returns in about three to five years. You want the exit to happen in that time period and increasingly through an IPO, an initial public offering. Now, that's fine for particular areas. It's not fine for the areas like clean tech, like nanotech, like biotech that take 15 to 20 years. That's the innovation cycle, 15 to 20 years. Um, and what's interesting, and, and I will tell you then the capital gains story that Warren Buffett was talking about, you know, the reason that capital gains fell so drastically, 50% in um, six years, from 1976 to, sorry, I'm completely dehydrated because I've been on a plane, I'm very jet lagged, um, by 50% in six years was actually because the National Venture Capital Association, which formed in 1976, lobbied government extremely hard 
in that year started to, saying, you know, we're the innovators, we're the entrepreneurs, reduce our capital gains tax and we will invest. And they were very successful. Um, I do lots of different studies of innovation at the sector level and also at the industry level and um, national level. And I started looking at, you know, what do studies actually tell us about that relationship between capital gains and um, an investment in innovation, or even investment in general? And there's no relationship. Um, because, precisely because of what Warren Buffett was saying, if you want to invest, you will invest if you think that's a good opportunity. The only effect that capital gains tax has had in, in reducing to the level it has, but also within the uh, capital gains tax, the particular details, is actually has been to fuel inequality. Um, in the UK, when they tried to foster a silicon roundabout, <laughs> um, that's what they call it, in the east of London, um, they, uh, one of the first things they did, and this was actually a, a, a labor uh, government that did it, it was Gordon Brown when he was um, the treasury, the head of treasury for Tony Blair, they thought, oh, we need venture capital, right? This is the, the secret to Silicon Valley. And what they did was they reduced the time that private equity has to be um, invested in order to be eligible for tax reductions from 10 years to two years. Okay, so when I say that venture capital is short-termist, it's not that it has to be short-termist. By hyping up its role, we have actually, in both the US and the UK, made it increasingly short-termist. Okay, that particular change in the UK actually rendered venture capital more short-termist. Um, what's interesting is that pr as private finance has become more short-termist, for example, just focusing on the exit through the IPO in three years, in the case of venture capital, what we've seen, and this is actually quite recent, is the role of particular types of public financial institutions increase, okay? So the Bloomberg New Energy Finance is a database where you can actually look at the entire world's uh, public and private types of finance in the green space. Um, and in 2011, I remember the figure, if you took all of private finance in the world, so it's corporate, private uh, equity, venture capital, and stock market. It was 11 uh, billion. And then just a particular type of public finance, so not like Department of Energy, ARPA-E type stuff, just four um, public banks, okay? So these are state investment banks. It was the German KFW, the Chinese China Development Bank, uh, the European Investment Bank, and the Brazilian uh, Development Bank. It amounted to 80 billion. Um, and what's interesting is that this is new, okay, because it used to be that these banks, this, this data here in particular is the KFW, it's a German state investment bank, these banks used to basically do what Keynes said they had to do, where Keynes said, you know, the role of the public sector is not to do what the private sector does. What does the private sector does is it invests too much in the boom, too little in the bust. So what the public organization should do is be counter-cyclical, not pro-cyclical. So they used to just focus on this counter-cyclality. So during recessions, when private banks stopped lending, the credit crunch, they would sort of kick in and lend. And they would also focus on what we call capital development of the economy, so infrastructure projects. What we're increasingly seeing in the next big thing is the role of these public banks directing, so picking, directing this counter-cyclical uh, loans and disbursements into particular areas, and the green area has in fact been pretty generally picked by uh, the most active banks, which are basically the Brazilian, the Chinese, and the German, and the European investment banks. Of course, other countries do have state investment banks. I'm talking about the mission-oriented ones. Um, both the German government and the Chinese government have a very specific mission around um, green, the, the China's 2020 goal, in fact, is to produce 20% energy for the entire economy from renewables. And this China Development Bank has been playing you know, a DARPA-type role, picking particular types of innovative companies, including, by the way, Huawei, which is number one today in the telecommunications. It's the number one company, even without the U.S. market, it hasn't been allowed to enter the U.S. market, received a massive loan from the China Development Bank. But if you look at these figures, they're absolutely astounding. Uh, you know, particular companies receiving loans in the billions. Um, and this is why it is often accused of being anti-competitive. Okay, it goes against the competition rules, which is actually quite difficult because 
if it's true, and I would argue it is true, and this might be something we debate later, if it's true that private finance is retreating from the real economy, and I'll show you a figure later also proving it, um, then, uh, you know, and if innovation takes a long time and doesn't just require any type of finance, but actually requires this long-term committed patient finance, then, and if innovation is, you know, the way that firms actually compete, this was Schumpeter's point, by the way, Schumpeter said that all of neoclassical mainstream economics is very static, um, and it assumes that, you know, something like innovation can only be talked about in terms of imperfect competition. This would be a whole other talk, so I'm not going to go there. But the point is, if in modern capitalism, firms, firms compete through innovation, if innovation requires this long-term, patient, committed finance, and if that type of finance is, is increasingly not found in the private sector, which has become too financialized, a short-term, a speculative, call it what you want, then it's quite natural, then, that this kind of finance will have to come out of the DARPA types, the NIH type, the NSF types, the China development type institutions. So what does this mean for competition rules? You know, this is a, a big question that competition authorities actually have to grapple with. Um, BNDES, this is the Brazilian Development Bank, which by the way, when I go there, I, I, I go quite a bit to Brazil because of different research projects, and I've been looking into this bank. What's absolutely fascinating about this bank is that it's actually achieved what DARPA has achieved in terms of attracting talent, right? We often hear, or even just think of the Department of Energy in the US, uh, run by a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, up until recently, you know, a, a serious brain guy coming in, bringing uh, a level of vision, dynamism, and talent, which often we think is, you know, not normal, if you want, for a public sector institution run by a bunch of boring bureaucrats. Well, in Brazil, if you, you know, if you're a top economist coming out of one of the Brazilian uh, top economics departments or increasingly coming back to Brazil by, say, Harvard Economics, this is one of the best jobs you can get is actually to go to this bank. And it's a public bank. It's not a Goldman Sachs bank. It's very hard to actually do that. Now, I don't have time now to tell you how they've done that, but how to actually bring that kind of talent, expertise, and dynamism into these public sector institutions is the challenge. When you walk into ARPA-E, which is, you know, trying to do in energy, what DARPA did uh, for the internet. It's actually pretty cool. I mean, it does feel like Google. There's a bunch of nerdy geeks who know lots about energy, writing on blackboards, talking to each other, bringing in top scientists from places like Norway and Denmark, which, by the way, are two of the countries that are investing a lot in uh, renewables. It is a place of experimentation where failure is welcomed because you know that for, uh, you know, for every Tesla, you will have 10 cylinders. Um, and, you know, this, again, is the point, I won't read it, but this was a very nice quote from the Global Wind uh, Energy Council, where they're very clear that, you know, it's what kind of finance we need, and it's increasingly, this was just a study that they performed across the world, what kind of institutions are actually financing the Green Revolution, and they concluded that it was these, you know, different types of public sector institutions because the private financial markets were so short-termist. Um, now, this is important, right? Because we're saying we need these public-private partnerships, but we're often just talking about the public side as de-risking the private side. I mean, how lame is that, right? I mean, is that what I just described? They're de-risking the private side? No. These are examples in countries that have been successful, and of course the U.S. whole Silicon Valley type model is one of the examples that many com uh, countries around the world are trying to copy, you know, this is taking on risk, right? This is being courageous, setting these missions, man on the moon, green economy, internet, and, and taking on that risk, okay? And attracting, because this is fundamental, I just said it before, but I'll repeat it now, attracting the kind of big thinkers who are willing to engage in those missions. Um, but usually, we, you know, we talk just about the public and private in this, in, in this very static way. Now, I've already mentioned that one of the problems here is that the private investments today are falling. We don't have, I mean, another sort of provocative way to put it, we do not have in the Green Revolution the kind of commitment in long-termism that we had in the IT revolution in the private sector. Because Xerox Park and Bell Labs were in private companies, and they were fundamental to the IT investments, investing alongside the state, 
What we have today are, I mean, this is a wonderful quote. This is Bill Gates, you know, um, who is one of the seven CEOs in this American Energy Industry Council. And, you know, Bill Gates is a smart guy. He doesn't say, you know, he, he, he doesn't say, government, get out of the way, you're a big meddler. He's very specific here. He's saying, hey, government is important. In fact, you know what? We follow. Um, the private sector follows after the government has taken on the big risk. He's very specific here, though, notice. He's saying basic research. And I've just tried to convince you at least that, in fact, these government investments were along the entire innovation chain. But we'll forgive him just for that little error. But the problem is, um, you know, as I said, the American Energy Industry Council is seven companies. And because I sometimes have fun with uh, thinking about these issues, I started doing some calculations with uh, a colleague of mine, Bill Azonik, we calculated how much those seven companies that are represented in the American Energy Industry Council have been themselves investing in this big green uh, race because what they were asking for, or are asking for, is actually something that I think is very valid, saying, no, we shouldn't cut back government. We need more government. And how much? We want government to be doing the ARPA-E type projects. And they asked government to spend $16 billion more a year in, in clean tech and to give additional one billion to ARPA-E, you know, it was very visionary, but themselves were not actually co-investing. Um, and again, you know, where are the Xerox parks in that space? And why is this a problem? And, and this is the financialization I was mentioning before. Because these share buybacks, okay, what they are is, is, is focusing on boosting stock prices boosting stock options to boost executive pay in the end. If you ask companies, <clears throat> in fact, let, let me get that to a second. First, I want to tell you what's on the screen. Uh, this is a proxy for when people say we are too financialized. What do they mean? They mean that the pace at which the financial sector has grown has completely well, outpaced the real economy. This data here is for the UK. For the US, it's even worse. But I just wanted to show you that you know, you're not alone in this problem. This is showing you that financial intermediation, I can barely see it, as a percentage of gross value added has outpaced the real economy, which is basically that black line, everything but finance and agriculture. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons that industrial policy is back, because then policymakers say we have to rebalance away from finance, away from these terrible derivatives, credit default swaps, hedge funds, towards the real economy, right? So towards life sciences, IT, the creative sector. What they don't realize is just how financialized the real economy itself has become, right? So this is one of the points I've been making, which is the private part of the public-private partnerships has not been investing big time as it used to. Um, this, you should worry about the black line there. That's showing you the amount of repurchases, so buybacks, to R&D spending. Okay, so many companies, I shouldn't name them, but I have a feeling that my next slide I do name them. I might have to go quickly because I'm not sure who your sponsors are. Um, have been spending things, you know, uh, well, a particular company I have in mind um, has spent more money in biotech <coughs> on buybacks and R&D in every single year for the last decade except 2004. Um, the total amount of buybacks that the Fortune 500 companies have spent in the last decade, three trillion. When you ask these companies, why are you doing that? Why aren't you spending on R&D? Why aren't you spending on human capital formation? They say, because there's no opportunities. This is the right thing to do. You know, when there's no opportunities for investment, the, you know, giving back the money to the shareholders is the right thing to do. You then look at the, those sectors where this phenomenon is the worst are health and oil. There's no opportunities in renewables. There's no opportunities in, you know, worldwide diseases. Hmm. Uh, we just showed before who's actually spending in those areas. And this is not public versus private. This is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying good guy, bad guy. Eh? I'm saying this is part of the debate that we should be having. To have that kind of smart innovation-led growth, what kind of companies do we actually need to be investing alongside the state? And why is it that we always have to justify any type of state intervention instead of actually trying to also justify public policy, which is going to try to foster also more of the Xerox Park type uh, investments and not allow here, let me go quickly over that one. Because um, I, di I did realize I recently gave a talk and I had all the names of the sponsors and afterwards they were like, we're gonna have to take that off of your slides later. And I think this will be easier for you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, okay, let's go back. <laughs> okay. 
good. Um, by the way, Apple is, is really interesting because under Steve Jobs, Apple did no share buybacks. Okay? When you look at a particular sectors, this is what I was getting to um, at the beginning when I said markets or outcomes. If you look at telecommunications, as I mentioned before, Huawei, number one, no share buybacks. Ericsson, number two, no share buybacks. Cisco, massive share buybacks. Okay, these are choices that companies have to make. Um, uh, uh, pharma and biotech are extremely problematic, um, but as I showed you before, also the emerging clean tech space is also very problematic. Now, why is this important, and why did I have on my first slide this whole thing about value creation and, and value extraction? Well, one of my key points is that by completely dismissing and not talking about the role of the public sector, and by that I mean the taxpayers that are in fact funding all these different agencies, the DARPAs, ARPA-Es, NSFs, SBIRs um, in the US, but in these other countries, these, for example, the state investment banks, by not talking and admitting the role that the public sector plays in this entrepreneurial, knowledge-based economy, we have in fact socialized the risks, but privatized the rewards. You know, Google's algorithm funded by NSF, we know how much Google pays back tax to the, to the government. Apple, it's been in the, in, in the headlines, right? Uh, Amazon, these are companies that have ex you know, benefited extremely, not just from the roads, not just from the educated workforce, but specifically from government taking on massive risks in particular technologies that their profits today are riding on. And of course, these companies themselves have done amazing things, as the example I gave of Steve Jobs. But if it's true, if it's true, that the government played a pivotal role in fostering these technologies through its ability to think in a long-run way, then who's going to fund the next round, right? Um, do you know what tax was, the marginal income tax was under uh, Eisenhower, who was not a communist? Eh? Exactly. Well, uh, close to 90, yeah? I mean, this was a Republican general. Now, I'm not, of course, advocating that we should go back, advocating that we should go back to that kind of tax rate, but the point is, how those tax rates, tax rates fell, how capital gains tax fell, it actually co-evolved with a discourse, a narrative about who the innovators were, who the entrepreneurs were, who was fundamental for the knowledge economy. Um, and in fact, those reductions in tax today, and I don't want to talk so much about the rate of the tax, because that's not the point, but um, this discussion about government tax way and uh, do things like R&D tax credits is, is not evidence-driven. I've studied a lot these R&D tax credits. There's almost no additionality. In other words, they don't make R&D happen that would not have happened anyway. They do have an effect in countries like the US where you do have these huge public funds which are then driving the investment, so the R&D tax credit is like icing on the cake. But they don't make the R&D happen, okay? Um, and this is also a big problem in Europe, by the way, where we're reducing, we don't have public labs anymore. They've all been destroyed. And then we do, you know, engage with these R&D tax credits and venture capital thinking that big things are going to happen and then scratch our heads on, you know, why didn't it? Um, but quickly, because I don't want to take up too much time. I, yeah, I need to finish in about five minutes. Um, you know, this, this whole risk-reward thing has become sort of front page, right? Front page also in the streets. Uh, this issue about the 1%, the 99%. This graph here just shows you, again, it ain't a finance problem. There's plenty of profits out there. There's record level profits, in fact. And how uh, a, a very nice way also to think about it, because you can calculate GDP in different ways, demand, product, but also income. And if we look at income parts, you know, the profit to wage ratio has just whew, gone uh, off the charts, especially if you look at it over the last hundred years. Um, now, the explanation that we usually hear about this in terms of you know, innovation, inequality, some people being left behind, yes, profits are soaring, but that's because, hey, some people had some great ideas and they're making profits from that, and others, mm, yes, workers are you know, fundamental for the production process, but those who don't have the right skills are getting left behind, and hope, so that's... Uh, fostered a very important, in fact, discussion about retraining and how to allow those left behind to catch up. However, is that really what's driving you know, that difference? Um, is it perhaps something else? I mean, I would argue that the skills problem, which technically economists talk about this in terms of the skill bias of technical change, um, 
explains sort of the middle problem, right? So the, the, the uh, problems that we have in uh, uh, achieving middle class type jobs that are of, um, of the type that we used to have. I don't want to go into the, the skills problem because it is quite complex, but the 1%, 99% problem, the fact that something like 50% of the gains in the IT revolution era have gone to the 1%, is that because of skills? What I would argue is that in fact, it's about value extraction. And one of the really interesting uh, facts about innovation, right, by people who actually study innovation, so it's a collective process, it's very uncertain, it's not just risky, but it's also cumulative. Okay, so people like uh, Brian Arthur and Paul David have talked about innovation in terms of it being path dependent. Okay, innovation is persistent. Innovation today depends on innovation yesterday. It's cumulative. And what we have is, in fact, because we haven't had the right story about who is actually contributing to the process, we've actually allowed particular types of agents, um, including large venture capital companies to enter late, sort of think, you know, this is time on the horizontal axis, halfway through, and um, reap not just their marginal contribution, okay, the rewards compared to the actual risk they took, but actually reap the entire integral underneath that curve. Um, now, what to do, okay, well, there's all sorts of things one could do, and I don't want to advocate any one particular measure, in fact, you'd need a lot of lawyers in the room to do that. But we haven't even had the debate, okay? I mean, are taxes enough? Forget even just the fact that they've been uh, falling and that we don't have the right, necessarily, I would say, political atmosphere today to even talk about tax. So let's just forget tax. Let's just assume that it's, it is being collected, okay? Everyone's paying their tax. Is that really the way that government would be able to reap back its reward in a situation where, again, for every Tesla, you have 10 cylindras. That's a massive failure rate, right? And venture capital has it also. Venture capital investment, something like nine out of 10 fail. But the one winning investment, right? So for Kleiner Perkins, that Genentech investment more than covers the losses and also covers the next round. We don't have that for government. Why? Because we haven't admitted that it's a venture capitalist. By the way, if you look around the world, there are some countries where this venture capital role of government is, is much more obvious, and one of these is Israel. Um, but in the US, you know, one of the funds has actually come out of the CIA through InQtel. Um, you guys probably know that because you're, you're, you think a lot about innovation in this area, but you know, most people in the US would be like, ah, what? You know, CIA doing public venture capital? Well, yes. Um, in fact, the touchscreen display investment also before that I mentioned was also uh, funded by the CIA, not through NQTEL though. Um, anyway, you know, why not retain some equity? Citra, a public funding agency in Finland that invested in early stage Nokia, did retain equity and made a lot of money from that investment which then funded the next round. The fact that then Nokia you know, has, has, has not been too smart in reacting to the smartphone, that's, that's a different problem. It's not because it re, you know, received that money. Um, but the state investment banks, for example, what's very interesting is they obviously retain uh, equity because they're investment banks. But we also have a real issue with the patent system, the IPR system. We have the Beidol Act, which was a good, I think, policy, which in 1980 allowed publicly funded research to be patented, um, which it couldn't be before that. This was a measure that was thought up in order to enable more commercialization, get science out of universities and actually into producing products that in fact fostered the whole biotech revolution uh, because many of these patents actually then became spin-outs. But there is a, uh, there is, if you actually read that act, it's a very big act, it actually says in there, but of course we have to make sure the taxpayer doesn't pay twice, right? That would be kind of stupid. So one way to do that would be actually to allow government to have a say on the prices. It's never executed that right. And I think also the reason is because of this, this, again, this discourse we have, right? If the role of government is just to foster innovation in the private sector, create those conditions, and then allow these revolutionaries to do their things, then what right do you have to sort of, you know, talk about prices? Um, it, sh it should be these innovative companies that set their prices to recoup their costs. Well, increasingly, in fact, if you go to some of these uh, big conferences that the Financial Times organizes for the pharmaceutical industry, they are very outrightly saying, we're going to close down our big R&D labs and our private companies because, in fact, the 
open innovation system is allowing us more and more to get the sort of niche radical ideas either out of these small biotech companies or, when they're honest, out of this big NIH funding. In fact, Pfizer recently closed a, a plant in Sandwich, Kent, and moved to uh, Boston, not because of lower tax or lower regulation, but because of that uh, NIH funding. Anyway, they're saying quite openly that they're going to close down these R&D labs, but the discourse is all about this open innovation system. But of course, the pricing policies have very much been based on the fact that the R part of R&D is so uncertain. So one question would be, as you are outsourcing increasingly that R to the public sector, then how much, you know, how much uncertainty do you really have to actually be uh, still charging these you know, absolutely very high prices, which make the taxpayers that funded their research not even be able to afford it. Even in countries with a welfare state, it's still the state that then funds the welfare state, so it's still paying twice. Um, uh, yeah, so income contingent loans, we do it for students, why not for companies? And you know, how, again, to do this is very complicated, but hey, if you can send a man or a woman to the moon, we can figure this stuff out. Uh, you know, Google, again, this grant that was given to the two Google guys, who then, you know, the, that, that ended up with the algorithm, sorry, the grant uh, resulted in the algorithm behind Google, there still could be something, even in those grants, that says, you know what, this is just a grant, do your thing. But if it results in something that leads to X billion, then over time, something will come back to, let's call it an innovation fund, um, to fund the next round. Now, again, I'm putting it in a very simplistic way. Of course, it'll be easy to find a fault with how I just said it, but the point is, let's have that conversation. And of course, by having that conversation, not only will we make sure that we get a sustainable cycle where, for example, the profits from the internet can then fund the next big thing, which might be green, which instead today we have a serious budgetary problems in these organizations that are supposed to be funding the next big round, uh, this editorial piece that came out today in the New York Times. Well, my book, I was very happy to see it. I, I wasn't expecting it. In fact, talked about the huge uh, uh, cuts that are being made to the public uh, research system in the US in the name of you know, reducing the deficit and keeping uh, uh, things tight in order to foster growth. You know, austerity is uh, going to help us you know, overcome the crisis by smelling down a government that has actually resulted in a $40 billion reduction in public R&D funding. Um, so, but it's also going to potentially make this growth more inclusive. Okay, not just smart, not just more sustainable, but also inclusive. Um, there's been you know, lots of talk about the public school system in Silicon Valley. You know, how wrong is that, that a place that receives so much direct funding, both for the companies and the technologies, hasn't resulted in a more equitable um, and inclusive public education system? Um, now, when I say it's a discursive battle, by the way, there's another great book by Tony Jutt. I don't know if you've heard of him. The book was uh, Ill Fares the Land. He actually says, he says, let's look at the last kind of 40 years of the way we talk about the state and how that's co-evolved with kind of, you know, bashing away at the notion of the welfare state. And he talks about this also globally. Um, and he says, you know, all of a sudden in the 1970s, this word administration pops up that didn't actually exist before to describe what government does. And you know, he, he just has it there in a little line of a particular paragraph, but to me it just completely jumped out. I mean, how boring is that? Who would want to go work in the government if that's all government is doing? Regulating, uh, regulating administering, meddling, right? So actually how we talk about this state completely then affects the kind of people and talent, and dynamism, and ability to think big in this missionary way, or missionary sounds bad, mission way. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to go into all these words, but you might have heard of some of them, right? I mean, crowding in, crowding out. We often hear that government, when it gets too active, is crowding out private finance. But within these particular areas I've been looking at, you know, whether it's green or IT, in the beginning of IT, what the government did was not even just crowd in, which is the usual Keynesian defense of what government's doing, which means that when you have underutilized capacity, if you have government investing through the multiplier effect, that increases GDP. So what you're actually doing is increasing the amount of total funds, both for public and private, right? That's the usual Keynesian defense of why you need government to 
to actually invest in times like this in a recession. What I've just described before in these different areas is government doing much more than just crowding in. It's actually investing in new areas and frontier areas which create a new space, which is kind of like, I mean, there's no word for it. I just call it dynamizing in. But the fact that we don't have a word for it actually also then affects how we evaluate the, you know, how we measure the performance of these investments. We actually don't have indicators that can describe to us what government did, so it's much easier, in fact, to come up with this kind of crowding out type analysis. Um, I see this even, by the way, with other types of organizations, like the BBC, which is a public broadcaster in the UK, which also gets accused of crowding out uh, private broadcasting because it has such a big share. Um, the quality of BBC programs, I don't know if you've ever watched them, but it's pretty high. But what's interesting in lots of these economic analyses of the BBC and its potential crowding out of the private broadcasters, the, ec the economist writing the, well, in, in this case, an actual economist, not the ac uh, Economist magazine, they will say, but of course, you know, we're economists. We, you know, we can't have a normative or subjective uh, interpretation of the quality of the program, so we're just going to keep quality constant. Right? And so, you know, Sky, Rupert Murdoch, or whatever, you know, we're going to assume that the quality is just something we can't measure. Now, it, that's really problematic. And I also see it in more technical studies of, for example, private and public venture capital, comparing the returns, completely dismissing and not looking at the very different risk space that the public venture capital, in these cases that I'm thinking of, these were Scandinavian public venture capital funds were investing in a very different risk landscape with much higher uncertainty that should affect compare the returns. If you don't have a measure for that, you're going to bias it from the start against these public investments. Um, De-risking, I've already said, uh, let's change that word. You share the risks and hence you share the rewards. Um, and again, that will affect how we attract these, you know, the best and brightest because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you just talk about the state at best fixing a market failure, you know, the, the more you're actually also affecting the kind of person that wants to go into that particular organization. If you are someone who wants to think big and, and experiment and feel part of an institution that is really raising the stakes and doing frontier stuff, and all you're doing is fixing market failures, that actually might affect uh, your choice of where to go. Of course, it's going to be more exciting to go work in Google and Goldman Sachs than it is to go work for uh, a public ministry in some country. Um, and by the way, this is a big problem in Europe where we're constantly asking ourselves, God, why can't we do our Silicon Valley kind of thing? And you know, why are all these great companies coming out of the US? The answer has been, because they haven't had this sort of analysis of understanding that venture capital surfed a wave of state investments, the answer has been we have to increase the market and reduce the state. And that is completely what we're witnessing today. It's not just since the crisis. Um, if you look at the innovation discourse in Europe, it's about in order to have the Silicon Valleys, we need to reduce the size of the public sector, we need to foster you know, early stage seed finance, and so this huge, uh, as I've already said, uh, um, um, rise of all these different types of venture capital funds and tax policies to foster that kind of uh, funds. Um, and then what's interesting, I don't know if you know this terrible word, pigs. I'm allowed to say because I'm Italian, right? If, if I was a German, this wouldn't be good, right? Because, you know, the Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, they're pigs. Uh, <laughs> this is what Goldman Sachs said. It was just literally the words. Then we actually increased it to Ireland as well, so it's no longer the pigs, um, which is a bit uh, less politically incorrect. Uh, but these are the weak, the, these are the weak Eurozone countries, okay? Um, and as you know, we often think, oh God, you know, they, they are you know, holding things down, the German um, mm, wallet is gonna be financing them during the bailouts. What we don't say is that you know, these countries, it's not that they were spending too much, they were spending very badly. Again, the German deficit was actually higher than the, than, than the Italian deficit, but if these countries, the pigs are not spending an R&D on human capital formation, on education, but also setting up these particular types of funding cycles that I've been talking about, which are able to foster these new innovations, then uh, uh, you know, that's why you have this completely skewed competitiveness in Europe, and we don't say that what they should be doing is, for example, what the Germans did, which was not tightening their belt. Um, it was actually spending on the KFW, this uh, state investment bank, 
Fraunhofer Institutes, which are these science industry links that are fostered in these institutions, called the Fraunhofer Institutes, very well funded. Um, very high R&D to GDP, but also directed towards these big missions like green. Uh, we don't hear that. That's not the medicine that we're, you know, that's not the analysis, the diagnosis, hence it's also not in the medicine. And what we have today is countries like Spain having cut their publicly funded R&D spending by 40% percent since 2009 in order to meet these new fiscal compact criteria. This is not only bad for Europe, it's of course also bad for the US because this European crisis will, which will continue as long as you have this very different competitiveness levels, will create a, a, a crisis because you can't have one currency for an area that has such different levels of competitiveness. I really should wrap up and I'll just say, think again. <laughs> Have a seat over there. Okay. I had a question as you were talking, thinking sort of historically, because you've looked at <clears throat> US and Europe over the past number of decades. And I noticed I was around for some of the early ARPA, when it was ARPA, not mm. DARPA, advanced research projects agency uh, within the Department of Defense later limited to DARPA defense, blah, blah, blah. So it could be completely innovative then. And that was a outgrowth of first the war, the Eisenhower years and all that, and then the Cold War, and then space race and all that sort of thing. And the information uh, technology sector that, that they were that pushing then you know, created basically computers, time-sharing, uh, ARPA, which became ARPANET, which became Internet, which became the world. Uh, there was a war framing there. Mm. And you, it, Herman Kahn used to say, uh, the one thing you really need a nation for is a war. And this is one of the reasons nations kind of like wars, because they justify themselves. Um, <laughs> But that's backing off, and you know, the Cold War died down, the peace dividend. It sounds like part of what you're describing mm. is the peace dividend. We didn't need the nation to defend us from these great big scary things anymore, so uh, let's just go uh, count on the private sector doing all the fun stuff. Is that any way the, the sense of what you see has mm. happened? And if so, assuming we don't want a war, uh, to you crank up the belief in government again. Uh, is that the narrative rethink that you want? I think there's two issues. The first is that um, looking again, for example, in this green space, those countries like Germany and China that are investing massively have actually framed it as a war. We have, you know, oh. climate change is a war. There's a war to be made, <laughs> had. Um, also, if, if you read the National Institute of Health website, they, they talk about it as a mission. Now, mm -hmm. they don't phrase it as a war, but, and of course, in the U.S., there is a, an issue also with the healthcare system, which is obviously different from the healthcare products. And that's um, a very interesting debate, the degree to which those countries that are the most innovative in the healthcare products are or are not also innovative in the system. Uh, which, which actually then breaks the drugs to the people. But, you know, if you read that website, it's, 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 very, it's very serious, right? I mean, there's a mission around healthcare. So the question is how governments, I mean, I'm thinking of it almost from the other side, think strategically and say, if we want to fund this stuff, we actually have to create a narrative around security interests, right? Mm. You know, we need to uh, invest in energy in order to maintain national security of our energy. But if you read, you know, be in between the lines, it's talked about as a war. But I would say another war is youth unemployment, you know, mm. the aging crisis, the demographic crisis we have today in many countries, which is putting at risk, you know, the kind of pension systems that people have relied on, that can be phrased in terms of war, in terms of a battle, a big battle. And I think what I was trying to say at the beginning is that these are big missions, big battles, which actually require then the government agencies that are investing to see themselves, I don't want to say at war, but part of a, a big battle. And instead, the narrative mm. 
mm. which has occurred, which I don't think has been um, necessarily how you mentioned, but I think it's actually been very ideological. There's been mm -hmm. lots of profits been made from this particular narrative, right? That only some are the innovators and others are just kind of there, either lazy or at best fixing conditions. That um, narrative has um, made it much more difficult for government to present itself as uh, a creator and an investor in these missions. Um, and then the question is, why has it become so profitable? You know, whether we talk about deregulation, but again, I, I don't want to steer the conversation too far away from your question, but there have been particular policies which have made it easier, sorry, I should look at you guys too, uh, <laughs> um, have been making value extraction activities rewarded over value creation activities. I know that sounds really abstract, but that's basically what we've had for the last 20 years. And that has, uh, I think, come out of policies which have been driven by a very narrow understanding of who the value creators are. Um, and again, the National Venture Capital Association was very explicit. They said, we are the value creators. Reduce our tax. So it wasn't just saying, you know, mm -hmm. this is good for the... Where do universities fit in this story? They're not exactly government and they aren't businesses but a lot of the R&D of great consequence goes on there. Mm. So what's their role here? Well, they have a huge role, but it's, it's very important to be specific on what that role is. So, um, and sorry if I keep talking about Europe, but hey, I live there, so I also see lots of mistakes that are made there. But mm -hmm. in trying to copy the US system, what they're doing in Europe is making universities increasingly like businesses. <laughs> and they don't get that actually what was very successful about the US system was that you had, and I know it's also changing here, but I think in a less drastic way, you had very high level, blue sky, properly funded research done in universities and early stage technology development done in companies. Then this you know, big notion that somehow the problem is commercialization and technology transfer and that's the big thing that's missing has, has turned lots of universities into these kind of technology transfer offices um, which uh, in Europe at least is also being, um, how do you say, uh, specified in terms of also creating spin-outs, right? So Cambridge University is you know, trying to create spin-outs. There was no spin-out policy in California. Spinouts mm. happened naturally out of very well-funded research system in the universities. And <clears throat> so actually better understanding the division of innovative labor between universities, companies, and of course the linkages between them is actually quite difficult. And it's not enough to say universities are important because in fact you can get a very dysfunctional university system by not actually, again, you know, talking about it in a very particular way. Um, and again, even though in the US you have lots of private universities, in, in Europe all universities are public basically. So Cambridge and Oxford are state, they're public universities. Um, but in, in the US, many private universities of course, like MIT, are massively funded by the private sector, sorry, public sector. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so just the notion, you know, when you say universities aren't really public, actually if you look at the sort of big science in places like Harvard, MIT, and and other important universities in Stanford. Okay. Here's an interesting one from David Weckler. It says, global, bus global business can invest and produce in a way that uh, address international opportunities. They, uh, you know, international corporations are international. Governments generally don't do that. You're focusing on governments very much. Are there means by which governments might join together, especially mm -hmm. on global issues like climate change, that, uh, <coughs> Have a, that they can, in a sense, think and act globally the way some uh, multinational corporations can think and act globally. Yeah, well I think, I mean, again, uh, if you think of the only public lab left in Europe, practically CERN, uh, it's, it's international, it's, it's European-wide at least, and it came out with HTML, um, you know, the, the language used by the web. Um, and. Uh, these, these public um, funding agencies in the green area, they are national in terms of the actual agency, so the China Development Bank is Chinese, but the investments it's making are global. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not just about um, international organizations collaborating, mm -hmm. but also 
particularly active national organizations that see the global uh, climate change problem as a global one. It's very interesting how they're seeing their own investments as global mm. investments. Um, by the way, what's also very interesting is that those few countries, because it, it, it's a handful, eh? it's a handful that do this mission-oriented stuff. It's not states, so I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about particular countries that have had mission-oriented state agencies. It's very interesting to see how they also tend to see other countries not as threats but opportunities. So Denmark, which is one of the most active in both wind and solar, has become the number one provider of high-tech services. So they're, they're not just you know, doing the products, also the services to China's green economy. And China's spending 1.7 trillion on its green economy. So a small country like Denmark, which has sort of been very active and innovative in that green space, is benefiting from the Chinese investments. So the, this is, a, I suppose, an advantage of there being lots of different nations, that some nations like Denmark can bear down and specialize in sort of become the market leader worldwide in that domain. Is that uh, you know, part of how the international system plays out here? The nations are essentially competing and each finding their niche and then jamming ahead to lead that niche? Yeah, I mean, don't forget the innovation, another sort of aspect of it. I mean, I mentioned, you know, that's collective, it's uncertain, it's also path dependent. It's also very, you know, another aspect of the path dependencies, not just this cumulative aspect, but also that, um, you know, um, let me just give you an example, carpets. <laughs> There's this wonderful story that Paul Krugman tells in a book he wrote called Peddling Prosperity. Carpets, when they started to be made, and I don't know anything about carpets, I'm just remembering the words he used, in a tufted way, um, don't ask me, um, was in the, in the middle of the 18th century, and all of a sudden, they all started being made in this place called Dalton, Georgia, and are still today, something like 80% of carpet production is made there. Why? Because there was this pool of labor of these young girls who knew how to make tufted bedspreads, and, and during when they would have birthdays, they would give each other these uh, bedspreads. And when carpet started to be made with this tufted technique, because that labor pool, knowledgeable pool of labor, was already there, somehow people figured it out, the, the carpet people, and, produ and started producing them there. And it's still today, it, 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 it has this niche, and that's because there's very strong sort of dynamic returns to scale. In other words, because it started there, then all the innovation ended up happening there. But the same thing you can say about the internal combustion engine. It wasn't a, you know, um, ex ante, the, the best engine. There was four or five different engines. It by chance got a, a little bit of a head start, and then all the innovation started to occur around that particular engine, so later it did become better than the other ones. But that's because of the dynamics. So it's the same thing with, with countries. Uh, Germany, almost by chance, started to specialize in machine tools, and it's still today the most competitive in the world in that area. So you have these very strong sort of path-dependent dynamics which are both good and bad. I mean, the fact we still have an internal combustion engine today in our cars is because we also get locked into, right, uh, uh, these technologies, that's also the example people often give of you know, the keyboards, the fact that we're still using today, the QWERTY keyboard is, is completely mad. Uh, anyway, do people know this story? Oh yes. yeah. yeah okay, so you know. <laughs> but it's the same thing with countries. The point is that these initial advantages, because innovation is so cumulative and path dependent, it's actually very advantageous to get the first mover advantage. Here, and here. so the fact that Denmark, Germany, you know, made mm. those investments, they still are today who are the most competitive in these areas, even though one of the issues is it should be a portfolio of investments. If you just choose wind, uh, you're going to be extremely susceptible to uh, changes. Are there scale advantages being a big country versus a small country? Either way. Well, yeah, I mean, Denmark is a very small country. Uh, the U.S. obviously is, is So they is only a had to get country. six people to agree to uh, take over that niche, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> I think the biggest difference between countries is not the size. I mean, again, uh, just think of uh, you know Singapore or you know take Finland. Finland was a, actually a pretty basket case country up until the mid '80s, and then it made a very explicit decision mm -hmm. to become an innovative country and invested massively, increased its investments in education, R&D. It developed agencies like CITRA. Um, Israel, the same. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say overnight, but these were decisions of you know we want to be innovative. We have to set up these kinds of agencies which will foster uh, 
So um, that was a question from Alex. Are there countries that are doing a great job of this kind of balance you're talking about? You mentioned Denmark, Israel, uh, uh, Finland, and mm -hmm. others. And, and are they... Hmm. Are they paying attention to each other the way businesses pay very close attention to each other and, and uh, you know, watch what's actually working? Is that the case here? I think so. Um, so, I mean, with, for example, these state investment banks, I know there's lots of conversations between the Chinese, the Germans, and the Brazilians in terms of how they are operating, but I think it's... Um, how, how, say more about that. How do those conversations occur? Is this conferences or visiting mm -hmm. each other's... You know, it's often lab. joint investments. So, really? you know, in this uh, global wind energy uh, uh, report that I mentioned mm -hmm. in, uh, in both wind and solar, uh, they often do make joint investments in, mm -hmm. in different areas. Mm -hmm. um, these aren't just sort of isolated projects. Mm -hmm. um, but I was at a conference recently in Brazil where they had the members of all the different state investment banks around the world there talking, you know, so there is a, they're trying to foster learning. But I think one of the most interesting learning processes is organizationally. So I know that you know uh, uh, the some of the Scandinavian countries were very interested in how DARPA was set up in terms of these kind of you know five year uh, second um, I don't, you you don't call it secondment here what do you call it when you leave one job but you hold your place and go work in DARPA for five years um, that kind of organizational hmm. innovation if you want was done so that you would get people coming into DARPA or ARPA E today and. Again, welcoming failure because their time there was going to be for four or five years. They weren't seeing it as a lifetime job, and so they were able to sort of engage and, and experiment and do the whole trial and error uh, thing in a public sector organization. I know that these types of organizations like CITRA or like the TSB in the UK have looked very closely at the DARPA model beyond just you know, funding innovation. It was an organizational innovation as well. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for these public sector organizations, to learn from the organizational aspects so that you don't get inertial into bureaucratic, which is just a cartoon image. And you mentioned Paul Krugman a minute ago, sort of approvingly, and it makes me wonder, who are the economists that you uh, pay closest attention to out there besides your immediate colleagues? Um, well, one of the issues, and I don't want to pick on sort of Krugman or Stiglitz, but I think what, one of the very interesting w thing with these economists that today are very active in the public debate is they don't have any theory of the state in the boom. Um, so often in the, um, you know, for example, in TV shows when they're, they have maybe a, a journalist who's trying to provoke them, they say, okay, so you're saying that government should be counter-cyclical, but where were you in the boom then? You know, mm -hmm. telling government to retract, um, and they have nothing to say. Um, because they have a purely Keynesian view, uh, or at least how they have interpreted Keynes, which is that government should be counter-cyclical. And yet all the investments that led to the internet were done in the boom. So this issue of directionality, um, you mm -hmm. know, that government is there when it's thinking big, when it's able to think up missions, where it's not just playing this counter-cyclical role, but actually making decisions about where these investments should go is actually quite important. And, and you know, you, you really see this today. I mean, how much quantitative easing did we have? Did that really cause growth? No, because it actually wasn't, you know, wh wh where did it end up? In bank coffers, not being lent. Um, so it's not just about creation of money or, you know, mm -hmm. Keynes also had this quote where he says, just dig ditches and fill them up again. Well, he said it out of desperation because, in, and he was right when he said it, you know, just get anything going, but it doesn't work actually in the long run. You can't just dig a ditch and fill it up again. You have to decide what kind of roads, what kind of bridges uh, do we actually want. And that directionality is often what we fear. We think that's government getting too active, picking winners. Um, let, let, let me just say one thing which I think is really important because when I say green, I'm not just talking about wind and solar and biofuels. I'm also talking about that but I'm actually talking about the transformation of the entire economy. And this is really important because mass production or electrification, which are also other big general purpose technologies, they took kind of like 40 to 50 years to get fully deployed throughout mm -hmm. the entire economy. And today, if you look at the IT revolution and compare it to electricity, we're just halfway there. Uh, you know, IT has not been fully deployed. And one way that I understand green, and I really learned a lot from a colleague of mine called Carlota Perez, a very important historian, is that green could be actually a redirection of the entire economy 
so that so, for IT to be fully deployed. And, and what I mean by that, <laughs> what I mean by that is suburbanization was a way that the mass production revolution got fully deployed. And suburbanization didn't just happen out of anywhere. It's not that people just woke up and said, oh, I'm gonna go live in the suburbs. I want a washing machine. It was an outcome of <laughs> policy. Mm -hmm. Policy, public policy made suburbanization happen. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not that suburbanization was good or bad. The point is it was a policy to allow mass production to get fully deployed. So the big question today is not state or no state, private or public. It's what, you know, what kind of growth do we want, you know, the whole smart, inclusive thing, but also how to steer. You know, IT can go in any way. You know, is it just another gadget we want? Or is it really a transformation of the economy in a direction that we want? And like it or not, it's only going to happen with strong public policy guiding it in that direction. And green is a pretty good choice. What do you mean by green? Yeah, well, OK, this then, I, the guy who claps should respond. <laughs> 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 OK, I mean everything. I mean things like even thinking about uh, you know, product obsolescence you know, how long products last. Currently, the way we think of product obsolescence, in other words, that you buy something and then you throw it away after five years, mm -hmm. first of all, it's not very green, but it also, also, it also emerged from a notion that markets are limited, right? That you only have so many middle-class people and those are the people buying these gadgets or washing machines, and so, you know, it, in order to expand your production, you're gonna have to make sure that they kind of fall apart after a while. And um, as you have an expanding middle class, all over the world, in fact, rapidly expanding, and some people also see this as problematic for green. In fact, that could potentially change how we even think of product obsolescence. It's no longer true we have limited markets. Markets are expanding, mm -hmm. and it should even affect how we think of that, yeah? But also, I mean, things like recycling, it's pretty low, low tech, right? I mean, you really could get the whole recycling area much more high tech and allow IT into that space. Uh, but also mm. maintenance of products, right? I mean, if we did have longer product obsolescence cycle, the whole maintenance area, first of all, could become job creating area, right? So mm -hmm. we don't have this trade off of green versus jobs. Um, but, but maintenance, not just you know, fixing a car when it breaks down, but again, you know, really thinking of it in a high tech uh, kind of way. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it actually could affect everything. Of course, green is also, I think, a portfolio of energy choices. And you know, it's quite interesting that fracking and shale, forget what you think about it in terms of the danger, all this talk about you know, that it produces these potential earthquakes un underground. It was 100% uh, state funded. Uh, if you're interested in this, the Breakthrough Institute's come out with mm -hmm. a great report on the history of fracking. But you know, that's, I think the danger of fracking is simply that it's limited the portfolio energy investments, renewable energy in investments by the current administration has completely uh, been reduced since the shale um, if you want, obsession, not so much revolution, because in fact it's been going on for, for many years if, if, if you read that report. So this limitation of the portfolio of renewables I think is a huge problem because as soon as shale and you know, that type of gas uh, doesn't happen anymore if we haven't been investing in renew renewables at the rate that we were before, and precisely because innovation mm -hmm. is path dependent, increasing dynamic returns to scale, we're going to be in a mess. Policy tends to sort of oscillate over time. Uh, everybody's doing X for a while, and then it's something else becomes a big deal, and that tapers off, and then they are doing X again. It's a new version of X. Is that kind of thing going on in this sort of public investment in uh, R and D? So is you know is it down now in some important mm -hmm. respects? Like you showed the NIH budget, sort of you know, or basically peaked and it now kind of dropped off a bit. Uh, does that mean it's going to just drop off and disappear, or is your sense that people sort of know, oops, we went too far in this direction, now we're going to correct, and you're part of that correction? Hmm. Actually, we're at a very unique moment. It, you know, what we've seen around the world, which is complete count, uh, pro-cyclical government, is unique. It's, it actually hasn't happened since World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether it's because of ideology or whatever, let's just, just say, actually, it's what's happened. So governments retreating during recessions, um, which is what's making these public budgets then go down in these particular mm -hmm. spaces, is, is something we haven't witnessed. Um, 
the NIH spending and the spending for the different areas underneath the Department of Defense, including DARPA, mm -hmm. have not um, undergone sort of big cuts. In fact, even you know Reagan, and um, who during the Thatcher era was someone who very actively proposed that we should have limited smaller government. He didn't reduce the uh, funding of these particular agencies. They actually increased under Reagan. So while there were massive cuts to state spending around, let's just call it the welfare state type area, actually in this innovation space, they haven't been cut. And today they're being cut because you just have this mass sort of austerity mentality where you know if someone like Obama has tried to resist but hasn't been successful in resisting it. And you know, don't forget that we didn't have counter-cyclical government before World War II. And the way you see this, by the way, is the consumer price index. Um, you, uh, it's a bit complicated, I'll just tell you quickly because it's fascinating. If you plot prices from 1800 to 1950, so through price indices, you often had deflation. So the price of you know, an object was actually lower in nominal terms than it was, say, um, the year before. Only once government started to um, uh, do what Keynes said, which was to actually uh, you know, enter the game seriously, did you start having two things. One, no more depressions. There was depressions every kind of 10 to 15 years. Depressions, not recessions. You guys and myself are used to recessions happening kind of 10 to 15 years. Completely elimin uh, eliminated depressions up until recently, this last crisis, because you had this worldwide cutback together in government spending. Um, but also prices all of a sudden mildly rising. And as long as you have a low rate of inflation, it's okay. In fact, it's a sign of growth, of stable growth. It's only when you have really unstable growth, so depressions happening kind of every 10 to 15 years, that's when you have this persistent kind of deflationary periods. Um, but the big point is that actually this Keynesian stuff worked in terms of preventing uh, depressions because the reason you get a depression is that when you get a recession, that's when consumers are spending less and companies are spending less. If on top of that, government is also spending less, then, you know, it becomes a vicious cycle. So what you need is that counter-cyclicality, which actually worked. Um, now, whether then you have too much of it, et cetera, that's another problem. But the fact that all of a sudden, since this particular crisis, since 2007, you had governments around the world being pro-cyclical has just been a disaster and has affected the, the spending. And they'll learn their lesson and do better next time, and thanks to you, <laughs> we hope, right? A uh, couple of questions about China, and you can imagine China must come up a lot. Uh, Mary Kay Majestad asks, uh, the Chinese government is putting many billions of dollars into trying to encourage innovation, but isn't yet getting the results it wants to see. What's the balance that you think is needed between government funding and other factors to encourage innovation? And Kevin Kelly asks, do you think China today is doing a better job with the entrepreneurial state, and how do the Chinese respond to your thesis? Hmm. So when I, I, I recently was in China, I gave a presentation at a uh, ministry called MOST, Ministry of Science and Technology, and I gave them you know, something similar. And they said, so I don't get it. You know, why? So why is, uh, why is the story not known? I mean, of course, the industrial mm -hmm. might of, of the US we know was you know, fundamentally a result of this kind of spending. How can it be that people don't know that and that then there's you know, not that kind of discussion? And you know, that's what they, was, they were very interested in. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they even said, how can it be that people say government meddles in the healthcare uh, area when actually what you're saying is government created the drugs? You know, government is part of the innovation system. And so they were very interested in the lack of public knowledge, if you want, of, of the role that government has played. But what's interesting in China, the challenge in China is that how, how they're doing it is very top down. It's mm -hmm. very much kind of ministry led. Um, it's very much, you know, again, the China Development Bank playing a massive role. So if it's true, again, big if, that this stuff is more successful when it's kind of this decentralized network of public and private agencies interacting together in a dynamic, well-funded way, what does it mean for that ecosystem, which currently is still quite top-down? Because don't forget that, you know, spending on R&D is not enough. And, spi and, chi and China has increased it by 170% over the last mm -hmm. five years, its amount of spending on R&D. We know lots, if you look at Japan and the USSR, or sorry, the ex-Soviet Union, um, Japan was spending 
less than the Soviet Union on R&D. They, they were spending quite a bit, but less, much less actually. Their R&D to GDP ratio was hovering more around 2%. Uh, and the Soviet Union's around uh, 3.5, and yet Japan grew much more. Why? Because it had these horizontal linkages. It has what we call today system of innovation, where this new sort of knowledge, information, science actually could get properly diffused throughout the economy because of the science industry links, also because companies themselves had these horizontal kind of teamwork type uh, structures, but especially between the institutions. There was, it, there was lots of... Uh, of um, dynamic linkages, whereas the Soviet Union was very top-down mm -hmm. and very defense-led, so there was very little innovation you know, distributed throughout their economy. But the fact that they didn't have the science industry linkages, that within companies, you know, the, the top guy never went down to see what was happening on the shop floor, hurt this you know, dynamism in their system of innovation. I think that's the big challenge that China has today even though it's very, diff you know, it has So it's sort of a, a mirror image in a sense, at least in terms of the advice that you would give the U.S. versus China. In the U.S., you're basically saying, acknowledge the government and reward it for being a patient VC. In, in China, you're saying, okay, you got the patient VC part covered, but yeah. you need a whole bloody ecosystem that can take advantage of that, and you don't have it yet. Yeah, except that the terminology ecosystem is one thing I was trying to challenge because it is the trendy word today, you know, innovation ecosystem. And my point is, hey, be careful. You know, if you know anything about biology, ecosystems can be, you know, predator, prey, and, you know, parasitic versus uh, symbiotic. And we just don't even have it because we don't engage in this, in, in this, you know, conversation enough about what kind of public, what kind of private, not public versus private, then I think, and what I'm arguing is that we've built very parasitic ecosystems where we have socialized the risk, privatized the reward, and this is really hurting future innovation, but also making our societies not very inclusive. Thank you for a way better narrative. Thanks a lot. Thank you.